Number 10, Hedgehog. I bet all the things you thought people ate back then, you weren't expecting Hedgehog. I know I wasn't. This is medieval times, however, and sometimes food ran short. Sometimes you gotta do things you wouldn't normally do, and that includes eating a poor hedgehog. It starts by ending the life of a porcupine or hedgehog via the neck. Ooh, gross. Singeing all of those protective spine needles, gutting the poor little guy where it was then boiled so it would naturally unravel because you know they're always rolled up. Uh, alternatively, you could bake them in clay for that Hannibal experience. Sonic be nimble, Sonic be quick, but that quick enough to avoid our appetites. It's kind of sick. I don't know, I couldn't think of a rhyme there. It's just gross. People eating hedgehogs, man, come on. Number nine, kitty. Honestly, I was a little surprised by this one. No, not because it is a cat. Obviously, in Western society like ours, kitties are pets, and they're just decent animals. I can accept that other cultures, and in the past, Folks were different. It's what they do. There's nothing wrong with that. However, cats kind of have an interesting history. A lot of times, they're associated with bad luck or misfortune. And not just black cats, but cats in general. Medieval times were weird. So I'm surprised that they would even try and eat one. According to one medieval recipe, it involves removing the head because that's not for eating. Obviously, should have known that. It was thought that the cat brains could make you lose your judgment. I'd argue at that point we'd already lost our judgment, but okay. The next step is simple. You bury it in the ground for a night because that's what you do, and then you boil it in a broth with garlic. Uh, I love garlic and broth just as much as the next guy, I just, I don't know if that's the recipe I'd be going for. Oh man, I'm getting sick already. Number eight, beavers. Nice beaver. Thanks, I just had it stuffed. Huh, naked gun anybody, huh, no? I love Les Nielsen movies, what can I say? One day folks, I promise I'll be there. Speaking of Canadian icons, Beavers! It's my national animal, and if you end up on fairgrounds, you can almost bet you will find a vendor selling fried beaver tails. The northern states will know what I'm talking about, but for the southern and western states, who for sure eat this, but have a different name for it, it's, it's fried dough, it's not actually an actual beaver tail. Beaver tails are delicious, especially with a Nutella spread. Oh, that's my favorite. The hot Nutella, it's beautiful. However, in medieval times, beavers were quite popular. It makes more sense than you think. They were already valuable for their furs, and apparently, well, they were sought after for the round boys. You know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Cough here. The trend of gotta do what you gotta do is gonna come up a lot on this list. That's just kinda how things go. There's an animal, you're gonna eat it. Just, that's it. Number seven, roasted swan. This one is supposed to be a delicacy. Roasted swan. You just go to the park and see those swans floating in the pond and you think to yourself, yeah, I'd like to roast and eat those birds. Kind of a weird thing to think, but okay, sure. I know swans can be aggressive, but damn, okay. Anyway, more disturbing than daydreaming about eating unusual poultry is what medieval people did to prepare swans. One recipe calls for its guts and vinegar to be used in bread making. I think we'll skip on that one. And another one where the skin is removed, roasted, and then the skin and feathers put back on the bird, so you put it back on the dinner table for like a show and then peel it back off. It's just, it's strange. I feel like it's not very sanitary. I feel like the feathers are the dirtiest part. You you always have to remove the feathers, don't you, Chris? I don't know. It's weird. Number six, sheep's business. When you've trimmed all the meat and you're staring at an animal's piece of deal, there's only one thing left to do. Wash it, clean it, stuff it with 10 eggs, milk, fat, and roast it with ginger and cinnamon. Sounds yummy, honestly. I just wish it was a better, you know, cut of meat and not the sheep's meat. Like I said, it's a case of you gotta do what you gotta do. I know today there are some dishes involving the undercarriage of bulls, and I hear it's good, but uh, you can't blame me if a tad skeptical. So that one was all about a sheep's is, is gabagool, you know, is, uh, is Wiener von Schnitzel Miner. Number five, garbage stew. Ever walk down the stairs and say, Mom, what's for dinner? And she says, I don't know, but pulls off whatever she's got from the fridge and the pantry and makes a great meal even though deep down inside, she hasn't been grocery shopping because she got into the wine, but acted as if she had everything under control when she totally didn't. Shout out to all the moms up there who do great work. You're the best, way to go moms. Well, that's what medieval garbage stew was, minus the whole mom part. It's a little bit of everything, and anything, and everything that's left over. Guts, chicken feet, leftover salt, spices, if any were available, livers, 
You get the point. It's kind of gross, but at some point, after trial and error, you'd probably come up with something delicious. Enough garlic and broth, maybe a little bit more kitty. Throw in some sheep, gabagool while you're at it. Why not? You know? Number four, helmeted chicken. Working nine to five is hard. It takes tough people, both blue and white collar folks, with grit to wake up every morning and get the job done for their families. This is true of peasantry in medieval times. It was tough, but someone had to do it. So imagine, if you would, how you would feel after grueling days of work in the fields, defending your farm from foreign invaders and maintaining a family. That's a, that's, that's a lot, of, that's a tall order. After all that, you find out that royalty have been having extravagant dinners and meals and having meat every meal, which is kind of rare for peasants. It wasn't that common. Not only are they having meat, but they're having multiple types of meat at the same dinner and on top of that, they're sewing poultry on top of pigs to make it look like it was a knight in a coat of arms riding into battle. Just like a turducken, because they're bored, and that's that's what a helmeted chicken was. Boredom, Ugh, crazy. People are starving outside, and they're like, we should sew the chicken and the pig together. Number three, humble pie. I'll cut the brass tacks on this one. I've never had venison before, but I hear it's good. I'm willing to try it. I like trying new things. Then I can say no, you know. However, the entrails of a deer and other wild animals baked into a pie. Uh, that I'm not too sure of. I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm thinking about a bakery easy chef who's using his bare hands, which most likely haven't been washed, and he's pounding guts into the pie like a jackhammer. The sounds, the smells, and well, it just doesn't taste good in my imagination. However, this one was quite common. It was a very common dish in medieval times. I don't know why, but it was. Can you imagine eating a entrail pie? Oh. That must be awful. Number two, chicken beer. This one's great, you guys are gonna love this one. Beer, the elixir of life. It's how Homer Simpson functions, and honestly, I don't blame him. It makes sports fun and watching reality TV shows when you're forced to, enjoyable. Beer is no modern invention, and its hoppy roots can be found in ancient times. However, the Middle Ages were no different. There's lots of beer back then. Thank God. However, let's take a look at uh, a different recipe, if you will. This one includes raisins, mace, nutmeg, dates, and a boiled chicken beaten like a tough cut of meat. All of these ingredients were then put into a canvas bag and left to steep until fermentation took place. Now doesn't that sound like you just want to pop the caps of a couple of those bad boys? Boiled chicken beer? <laughs> yes please. More like no thanks. That sounds awful. Boiled chicken beer, god damn. And coming in the number one spot today, we have lamprey. Wait till the editor pulls up a picture of these bad boys. Hideous, ugly fish with lots of little sharp teeth around a suction cup mouth, perfect for sucking blood. They're blood suckers. While you cover up your wrist, medieval people love these little devils. This was also thought of as a delicacy. King Henry I loved them so much, in fact, well, it actually might have been his undoing. He ate too many of them, apparently. Gross. Stay off the leeches, guys. If anything, stay off the leeches. They're gross. Don't, don't. Mm -mm. No. Number 10, stuffed dormice. This list is going to be kind of tough, even for a meat eater like me. Dormice are small rodent animals found in the old world, like Europe and Africa and Asia. Bill wrote, you get it. But just as common as your American house mouse. As it turns out, they were a favorite of Roman cuisine. Oh, God, the horror. Sometimes they were even fattened up for a better meal. The rest goes as follows, because I just know the folks at home are salivating at the mouth wanting to try this. Get your farm fresh dormouse, empty its cavity, and stuff it with an assortment of other meats and spices. Oh, beautiful, magnifique, and sometimes dipped in honey. Like stuffed jalapenos, except they're from hell. Mice are also known for not being the cleanest animals on earth, so I, I'm going to hard pass on this one, brother. No thanks. Number nine, sea urchins. Uh, until today, I had never seen what the inside of a sea urchin looked like. I never did. That's when our most handsome boy Adam said, let me show you. Weird creatures, or at least to my North American palate they are. Very strange looking. Plus, when they were opening those bad boys up, it just looked like it was too much effort for a little bit of orange looking meat. Strange. Well, Romans being geographically located in the Mediterranean Sea found themselves around a lot of these bad boys and started to crack them open. I saw a technique with two spoons, but uh... Well, I feel like a couple good bashes from a Roman sword ought to do the trick. All the things in this list, this is probably the least gross. Although, I gotta say, you see a spiky thing in the water like that, and, and the first guy was like, we should eat this. It's so weird, why would you do this? It doesn't look edible. Number eight, flamingo tongue. 
Excuse me? I said, looking very cute at the computer researching this topic. Curb your tongue, internet, I said. I do not believe you. Alas, as cute and as blue and innocent as my eyes are, it was true. Romans were eating flamingo tongues. Ugh. Flamingos were associated with luxury, wealth, I mean, they are a strange color and it's close to purple, Romans love purple, and compared to the rest of the animal kingdom, it, it just doesn't really fit in, so yeah, sure, it makes sense. Well, the opulence in Rome loved flamingos and their tongues. My only hope is that they used all the birds. In my research, it said that poor citizens did when given the opportunity, but I just can't see the wealthy chopping tongues and that's it. Hors d'oeuvres, anyone? Number seven, garum. All right, if you're like me, you're a meat and potatoes kind of guy. When I was growing up, and I probably will be until I'm 80 in a senior home, that's just the way I am. Now, that being said, you can't have hockey pucks on the barbecue without her best friend, her luscious red lover, Heinz number 57 ketchup. Am I right, Chris? Oh, of course. Exactly. And yes, mom, I can tell the difference. Thank you very much. Well, meet the Roman ketchup that would be included at a lot of meals. Almost all of them, apparently. Garum. You take fish blood and fish guts and you pack a whole bunch of salt into it and stir it up until it looked like the forbidden tomato paste. You spread that bad boy out on a wooden plank, let it dry out in the sun for a week, and uh, bada bing, bada boom, baby, you're in Rome. You got yourself an apparent delicious condiment for every meal. Apparently, it was at a lot of meals, which is. Can't imagine that being very good. Salted fish guts, oof. Number six, ostrich. I like chicken just as much as the next guy. Matter of fact, maybe I like it more than the next guy. Any chef will tell you a fresh and properly prepared chicken goes a long way. You can make soup, stew, pasta, fried chicken, baked barbecue, roasted chicken, casserole, chicken burgers. I mean, she's flexible. You can do a lot of stuff and she's just so versatile. Now, the question is, is ostrich as flexible? I doubt it. They were an exotic bird even back then and apparently one emperor liked to shoot their heads with arrows for fun. That was part of the fun and games, yay. <laughs> okay, sometimes I can't believe the stuff I read. I'd say this is probably the second least grossest thing on the list, but I don't even know where to get ostrich. And honestly, to even try, I feel like a weirdo Googling that. Where do I get ostrich meat? I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. Number five, lamb brains. Ooh, gross. Okay, lambs are not my favorite, but it's not that bad. I can see why people like it. The right preparation would yield a delicious and nutritious meal. Especially like roasted over a fire or something. I hear lamb's pretty good that way. I never had it that way, but I hear it's good. Lamb's brains, however, uh, I don't know, man. Remember that scene from Hannibal where Anthony Hopkins cuts open the skull from the guy from Goodfellas and you get to see inside his brain and how a Goodfella thinks? A mafia joke. Oh look, there's a prefrontal cortex. Look at all those memories of beatings and extortion. Oh wow. All jokes aside, it's a gross scene. And I can't help but not forget about it when thinking of lamb brains. Well, the Romans, they loved them. Romans enjoyed lamb brains in a variety of ways from cured, boiled, Baked, oh, and more. One of Pickiest recipe even calls for lamb brain, eggs, pepper, and rose petals. So you never have too many rose petals. Number four, sow's womb. It's exactly how it sounds. I know, it's just another part of the animal, but some pieces, well, they just don't taste like the other do. They, they kinda taste worst. And when there's no yieldy Taco Bell, your options get stretched thinner than a contortionist who's out of a job and working street corners. So it makes sense to use all the parts of the animal, which I certainly hope they are. I certainly wouldn't want any to go to waste. While not as common as other dishes on this list, you would find the sow's womb prepared with various spices and oftentimes a mixture of vinegar and honey. I don't know if those go together. I don't know if that, that's, and I think sow is, I believe is pig by the way too, sorry, I forgot to mention that, pig or a hog or something like that, sorry. Number three, giraffe. I mean, okay, such peaceful animals are just all necks. Is neck even that good to eat? I don't know. Has anyone ever had giraffe before? I, I don't know. Another animal considered to be very exotic for the time, even back then, sometimes they would even find their way into the arena to fight themselves or other animals like lions. Kinda crazy. If you've ever seen a giraffe fight before, you know how brutal they can be. It's basically who can whip their neck back and forth the hardest and the fastest. Scientists uncovering artifacts from an ancient restaurant in Pompeii found remains of a giraffe leg, so it actually may be more common than we think it was. Number two, jellyfish. Squidward. 
There's only two things I know about jellyfish. One, in SpongeBob, jellyfish produce a most delicious jelly, hence the name, and that goes on a Krabby Patty. Remember that episode? It's one of my favorites. Two, jellyfish got some nasty stingers, some of which can prove to be lethal, and no amount of Bear Grylls knowledge in urine can save you. He pees on them. I saw him do it once and now I always remember that if I get I had to pee on it, but apparently that's not how you do it. Anyway, jellyfish were most likely not eaten every day on everyone's diet. However, there are mentions of it in some Roman writings. Picasus cookbook is the best collection of ancient Roman recipes to ever survive. It mentions of a jellyfish omelet as an appetizer. Although I gotta say, I don't know if jelly and egg go together like that. I don't, Chris is saying no too. I don't, that's, that's a weird one. Number one, blood pudding. Oof. This one I know that we still eat today and some cultures love it, but there's just something about the blood for me, personally. I just, I can't get over it. I, I get lightheaded thinking about blood and the taste. Well, I'd, I think I'd rather suck on an iron girder. <laughs> well, I called the chief who was a world-class chef and he said, it ain't it. Roman blood pudding, or sausage, was prepared by mixing a very readily available resource of lifeblood and fat and oats to make for a very uh, loving, Tasty meal. I, oh God. Sometimes it was even put into sausage form with animal innards. Just cause, you know, go ahead, fry those, fry those bad boys up. Cook them up for me, you love the, oh, I can't even say it, dude, it's so gross. Just go ahead and cook those bad boys up. It sounds great, I promise I won't puke at the dinner table. 